Uh, Defence Minister for Israel and indeed a former uh, commander of the uh, Israeli Defence Forces in the uh, dim and distant past. Uh, we're expecting more comments from them at some point in the near future and we will bring that to you live, of course, here on Sky News. In the meantime, welcome to this afternoon's edition of Business Live. And we begin with Manchester United because shares of the club have fallen by more than 10% on the New York Stock Exchange today following weekend report that Qatar Sheikh Jassim bin Hamad Al Thani will not go ahead with a takeover of the club. That would appear to leave Sir Jim Ratcliffe, the billionaire businessman who owns the chemicals giant Ineos, to press ahead with a 25% uh, takeover of United. His offer is set to value the club at six and a half billion dollars. We'll join him in as our sports correspondent, Rob Harris. Uh, Rob, welcome to you. I mean, um, what will the, the fans make of this? Won't be terribly pleased, I imagine. Well, no, we've seen so many fans going out in the streets around the stadium, almost wishing for that Qatari takeover to happen. Perhaps seeing how other nation states have got a stake in clubs and managed to inject so much cash. Although, of course, the Sheikh just in bid team always said that they were not connected with the state. Although, one of the biggest shareholders in the Qatar Islamic Bank, that Sheikh just in does run is actually uh, the uh, Qatar Investment Fund. What do we take from the fact that they've walked away? Well, this has been a protracted process of so many deadlines, renewed bidding deadlines that we didn't know, and then new offers put in. So it's been quite an unpredictable process, but they did let it be known over the weekend that they have pulled out because they won't meet the Glazers' valuation. And that has been the challenge all along. You've got the six Glazer siblings. Just what price do they want for the club? They paid £890 million for it in 2005. Obviously, the leverage takeover, they've earned so much back from the club. And yet it seemed to them that the five billion or so being offered in pound terms from Sheikh Jassim was not acceptable. And perhaps they're looking for sort of something closer to around something that values the club at six billion. But what does Jim Ratcliffe want with a 25% stake of Man United? I mean, he's putting up a slug of capital, but he's not really going to get that much control, is he? Not with the Glazers sitting there with 75%. Yeah, and there are two sets of um, shares. There are the B-class shares, which carry 10 times the voting rights of the A-class shares. And there might be some disquiet from those holders of the A-class shares, that the fact you've got uh, Jim Ratcliffe being able to get this uh, stake into the club. It seems perhaps a way of ending the impasse in this process by initially getting 25%, then perhaps increasing the shareholding over the time. But for Jim Ratcliffe, we've seen over the years, he's gradually been getting more involved in sport, not in the shadows in petrochemicals that we've seen for so many years in France with Nice, the uh, football club, also in cycling with the, uh, the Ineos team that uh, emerged from Team Sky. So he certainly wanted a bit more visibility and perhaps uh, sport has been his way to it. But you see this potentially as a precursor to a full takeover down the line? Yeah, potentially so, or even further parties coming on board. And the reason Manchester United originally launched this process last November was the search for strategic alternatives, new cash to come in, because it's not just the stadium, it's the training ground. They've both fallen behind their rivals. You've got Tottenham Hotspur with their new 60,000-seat stadium in the last few years. Yes, Old Trafford is still at 76,000, but the facilities are dated. They couldn't be part of the UK and Ireland bid for Euro 2028 because it's not up to scratch. So they've fallen behind. Even as an entertainment venue, so many other stadiums getting concerts and all those sorts of venues. So they are needing that investment and, of course, in the team as well. The men's team, which has started the Premier League season by losing half of their eight games, they've lost both Champions League games so far, and that 10 years since Sir Alex Ferguson retired have not been successful at all. Yeah, absolutely. Now, you, I mean, you've been following this soap opera on and off for months now. When do we get a definitive response, do you think, from the Glazers and their advisers? Well, we are waiting for the uh, annual report. It's, it's beyond the usual time, we usually get it around September, so that is a key moment. When does that come out? Or is something going to happen around then? There is talk of a board meeting this week. We're less certain on that, but certainly uh, some progress might be edging closer. The fact sheet just made let it be known he was withdrawing, gave an indication that he knew perhaps he was out the running. All right, Rob, good to see you this afternoon. Thank you. Now, Poland's stock market has risen by more than 5% and there's Lottie risen by 1.5% against the US dollar and the euro after the governing nationalists appear to have lost the country's elections. The three opposition parties under the leadership of the former European Council president, Donald Tusk, are now expected to form a new government. It potentially means the EU's sixth largest economy could repair relations with Brussels, as the trio, Civic Coalition, Third Way and the New Left have all promised to re-engage with the EU if they won. Well, joining me now is Bartosz Savisky. He's market analyst at Contoxia Fintech. Uh, welcome to you. Um, why do the markets so much like the prospect of, of Poland re-engaging with Brussels? 
Well, the Zloto is the top performing currency globally on Monday, so it clearly shows that there, there's an element of uh, surprise uh, in this uh, elections outcome. Uh, the most um, uh, probable outcome, the, the most probable re result was a coalition between the United Rights, so the party that's been ruling in Poland for the last uh, eight years, with a far-right uh, confederation. So uh, th those oaths uh, were defied uh, due to the record high turnout, which accounted for almost 73%. And uh, markets are really enjoying the, uh, the prospect of uh, a more um, prudent uh, approach to fiscal policy, um, re-establishing the bond with the European Union uh, and uh, unblocking uh, the access to much needed recovery uh, found, which, uh, which is worth uh, almost uh, 40 uh, billion euros. So, so this is why the reaction is, uh, is so strong uh, in the domestic market on Monday. The opposition parties indicated during the election campaign that they would replace the central bank governor should they win. Why is that? Well, um, uh, most uh, elements, key elements of the Polish institutional uh, fra framework um, are believed to uh, be um, appropriated by, uh, by the ruling uh, party. So uh, not only the central bank, but also the constitutional court, uh, the public broadcaster, uh, Mr. Glapinski is believed to run uh, monetary policy in the way that should support uh, the uh, United Rights. So uh, basically we are talking about very sharp cut uh, rate cuts, which uh, happened uh, uh, in September um, and uh, sent uh, the slot sharply lower. Uh, this was uh, believed to be as an element uh, of support for the government. So this might be the reason why the coalition is uh, against Mr. Glapinski, but I hope that uh, they will refrain from those very sharp uh, movements and uh, leave him in his post. What about relations with Ukraine? I mean, the government had recently clashed with Kyiv over grain shipments and on benefits for Ukrainians living in Poland. Well, obviously, uh, no one can really doubt uh, Mr. Tusk, uh, who served as a European Council president uh, to strengthen his relationship uh, with the European Union and with other neighbors as, as well. I think that uh, no, this uh, deterioration in relations with Ukraine was a part of a, uh, of a campaign uh, and uh, was uh, aimed at uh, winning some support from the far right. And uh, I don't really believe this, uh, this is much a threat right now. Uh, given uh, the, the most uh, probable outcome, so the pro-European Union opposition party is forming a new government. Now, the, as well as the parliamentary election, there are also a number of referendum uh, questions posed, including raising the retirement age, selling some Polish businesses to foreign buyers. What do you think the outcome is going to be there? Well, I think that this uh, referendum is uh, not going to be bonding for the new government because the turnout will most probably be below 50 percent. And this is a constitutional requirement for the referendum to, to be valid. So uh, this referendum was uh, perceived as a, a way to um, distract or to uh, lead the, the campaign uh, in a certain uh, certain uh, narrative, certain way, uh, beneficiary for the United Rights. So uh, I don't think it's really uh, bonding. And I think that uh, um, uh, the relationship with the uh, with the Brussels, with the United, with the European Union uh, will be strengthened and Polish will uh, be closer to the European mainstream uh, than it was before the election. Do you think the, the new government, assuming that uh, we do get a coalition of the opposition parties, is going to be able to push through with market-friendly reforms? Well, uh, restoring of this institutional framework and unblocking the access to the U European Union funds uh, are top priorities for the new government. Uh, obviously, it's easier said uh, than done because... Uh, Mm, uh, the president origins from the law and justice united rights uh, policy camp. So uh, it's going to be uh, difficult uh, in uh, restoring uh, um, uh, the, the credibility 
of the uh, judiciary system and uh, getting rid, uh, getting rid of uh, all those um, accusations of uh, um, rule of law infringement. So uh, it's going to be tough, but I think this is a uh, top priority on the, uh, the new coalition agenda. So I think that uh, they will strive to, uh, to achieve uh, success. OK, Partos, we have to leave it there. Appreciate you joining me today. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Some other business news stories for you now. And the asset manager Aberdeen has agreed to sell its European headquartered private equity business to the Brazilian-based and Nasdaq-listed Patriot Investments. Aberdeen will receive an upfront payment of £60 million, with a further £20 million to come off two years after the sale is completed, with up to another £20 million to be paid three years from the sale, depending on how the business performs. Aberdeen said the sale followed a strategic review in which it concluded capital generated from the sale of certain of its equity businesses would be better deployed within its own core investment businesses. Shares of Aberdeen currently ahead by some 3.5% on the news. Marks & Spencer said today it plans to take on 10,000 temporary staff over the Christmas period. The retailer said this would represent 40% more temporary employees than it took on at the same time last year. m and said the increase reflects the additional investment it's making in colleague hours to support customers on the shop floor. It said the new employees would start from the 19th of November, with a range of start dates, variety of roles and flexible working patterns available. They will also enjoy benefits, including a 20% colleague discount from day one. US healthcare regulators have given priority review status to a combination of AstraZeneca's blockbuster cancer drug, Tegriso, with chemotherapy to treat a type of advanced lung cancer. AstraZeneca said today that the US Food and Drink Administration had made the decision following a late-stage trial which extended the survival of patients by nearly nine months without the cancer progressing. The FDA is expected to make a regulatory decision on the treatment during the first three months of next year. And one of the two arms of Rupert Murdoch's media empire is reportedly being pushed by an activist investor to make strategic and governance changes. The investor Starboard Value has built a stake in News Corp, owner of titles such as The Sun, The Times and The Wall Street Journal, as well as the book publisher HarperCollins. It's said to be pressing for News Corp to spin off its digital real estate division and end its dual-class share structure, which effectively gives the Murdoch family control of the business. Well, the news comes less than a month after Mr Murdoch announced that he would step away from it executive board duties at both News Corp and Fox, his other media business. Well, still to come here on Business Live, we'll have a look at how the markets have done this Monday afternoon. Don't go away. You're living with your mum. It's hard to be a rebel, but you get your washing done. And you can skirt around the issue, you can rock around the clock. And no one will ever miss you if you put it on TikTok. So I finally come to realize... It was shot in Jamaica on the Rio Grande. Well, fantastic little clip that we, we got there. And so am I right in saying that, that most of your career was behind the camera? This is, this is your first album. Kind of. I mean, it was primarily behind the camera, but I was with a band called Big Audio Dynamite mm -hmm. with a gentleman called Mick Jones from The Clash during the 80s. So it's not my first adventure in front of the mic. It's my first solo venture in front of the mic. And do you, now you've released it and it's sounding so great, do, do you kind of regret you didn't do this sort of thing earlier or you just uh, completes a, a great career for you? Not at all. I've never, you know, I never really wanted to be a pop star or switch lanes. I mean, this record is a product of the COVID lockdown, and, uh, which was interesting, right? Because what was interesting about COVID lockdown, it gave you a lot of time to think, didn't it? Mm -hmm. What was bad about it was it gave you a lot of time to think. <laughs> so with 67 years of living and this conundrum, it kind of fueled the lyrical content for this album. And I felt that the time was right to get it off my chest. And, and we, we obviously got a glimpse there, but what is the central message, if there is one? A central message, speak the truth. Mm -hmm. I mean, in times of crisis, that's all we've got. It's the most powerful weapon we have at our disposal. So all I've done is try to speak the truth as I see it. And at 67 years of age, I felt confident to be able to do that. This new batch of artists in the 20th, 21st century, yeah, the people that speak to me are few and far between because it's a new language that I don't really understand. Hence the title of the record, Out of Sync.
five of us have made it out of the car. Welcome to Backstage, the film and TV podcast. Slight image, slight better. Fly Emirates, fly better. Thank you. Well, European stocks have made a largely positive start to the week following the Polish elections and optimism over third quarter earnings. There's a position all the continental European indices have finished in positive territory. Obviously, the uh, Polish stock market was the standout performer, up more than 5% at the close. But here in London, the FTSE 100 has also uh, got off to a winning start, finishing some two-fifths of 1% higher. That's thanks mainly to gains for the mining heavyweights and some of the oil majors. In percentage terms, St James's Place is the biggest gainer. Obviously, uh, you'll recall it's uh, sold off very heavily on Friday afternoon. Looks like a bit of a dead cat bounce from there. Other gainers in the FTSE today include Seven Trent, which has had a push from one of the brokers, finishing more than two and three quarter percent up on the session. Among the fallers, GSK and AstraZeneca, which I mentioned earlier in the programme. Well, AstraZeneca's more or less finished unchanged. Glaxo uh, down uh, one percent uh, or so. Well, that comes after uh, it, their US rival Pfizer cut its full year sales forecast late on Friday. All of the uh, major European drug stocks are also lower this afternoon. Outside the FTSE, Hypnosis Songs is off 10.5%. It's hit an all-time low. That's after the company scrapped plans for its latest dividend. Over on Wall Street, all of the main stock indices have opened to the upside, ahead of what is going to be a very big week indeed for quarterly earnings. Among the gainers this afternoon is Lululemon, the uh, clothing uh, company course. That's up uh, 9% after it was promoted to the S&P 500. It's replacing Activision Blizzard, whose takeover by Microsoft went through at the end of last week after the UK Competition and Markets Authority, of course, uh, gave it the green light. On the foreign exchange markets, well, there's been a bit of uh, safe haven buying of the US dollar, particularly uh, in emerging markets. But here, as you can see, sterling has finished up some two-fifths of 1% higher against the greenback, the pound, more or less unchanged against the euro. The single currency, meanwhile, up just over a quarter of 1% against the dollar. As for the oil price, well, that spiked higher on Friday evening to trade above $90 a barrel for the first time in a week, and that completed its best weekly gain since February. It has, however, as you can see, slipped Today, a barrel of Brent crude will currently set you back $89.82 a barrel. That's off just over 1% on the session. Well, joining me this afternoon is Bill Blaine. He's author of the Morning Porridge newsletter and strategist at Shard Capital. Bill, good to see you. Um, Great to be here. Big news this afternoon in Italy. Big budget, lots and lots of tax cuts. Yeah, now this is a very interesting move because if you're looking for crisis in Europe's debt markets, the place it's likely to start is going to be Italy. We all remember how close they came to disaster just over 10 years ago. And yet this afternoon, the Italian parliament has approved a 24 billion euro tax cut and salary increase for civil servants so they can try and boost the economy. Now, if you've got that vision of Liz Truss just a year ago, that's where I think you want to be thinking. But the, 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 this is really even more serious, if anything can be, uh, because if Italy starts to wobble, that becomes crisis for the whole of Europe. Now, people think that Italy is a sovereign debt market that if it gets into trouble, it can just print its own money. But of course it can't. It has to go to the ECB. And the ECB, as we all know, 
moves at the speed of a very slow glacier. <laughs> I mean, I was looking at Italian government bonds this afternoon. I mean, the yield on the 10-year was, was still around sort of 4.8%. I mean, that's not quite at crisis levels yet. Well, as I left the office today, it was starting to bounce higher. And it's certainly trading at very elevated levels. Now, I think what we need to watch is what follows this. What else are people going to be saying about Italy and its, uh, the sustainability of its debt market? One of the things we like to think about in sovereign bond markets is what we call the virtuous sovereign theory, which is our trinity, which is that if you've got a stable currency and you've got a sustainable bond market and competent politics, then it all goes well together. But you break any of these legs and you get a Liz Truss moment. Now, my concern is that this just becomes the start of something similar happening and Italy is going to be the first case. I mean, this would push the Italian deficit this financial year up to about 4.8%. Does that matter when... I mean, Macron's going to run a deficit of more than 5% this year. Yeah, but you've, when Italy's running 140% of GDP as its outstanding debt and they have the worst demographic crisis in Europe, it's probably going to suffer deeper from a potential slowdown recession in Europe. Um, Italy is the worst place. It's, it's uh, the canary in the coal mine for the rest. Now, it is very interesting that you bring up France and, of course, Germany. Germany's not got a debt problem at all, but it's going to be falling into recession. But if we see the euro under pressure, then we could certainly... If we see nations like Italy suffer, then we see the weakness in the euro... And that, perversely, of course, could end up benefiting Germany as one of biggest Europe's exporters. Exactly. So, I mean, there are implications here for the euro as well and how that uh, fares. Everything is connected. As I said earlier, you've got a strong bond market, stable currency and competent politics. Tick box. <laughs> when one of them goes wrong, then you start to worry about all the rest. So what, what triggers this sort of Liz Truss moment, then? We've, ha we've had the news. It's, it's well, really I, I think when you've got a nation that is already heavily indebted and decides to pay civil servants more by cutting taxes at a time when they desperately need to rein in debt. Now, there is an angle where you could raise more debt, but you need to be in complete control of your currency to do so. And Italy, of course, is not. It's entirely dependent on the ECB approving its borrowings. And, of course, I mean, lest we forget, when they came to power, the first thing they did was uh, unwound a proposed rise in the retirement age as well. Exactly, yeah. Um, now, as I said earlier, this is a canary in a coal mine because you're going to see the same problems reflected in debt markets in the UK and especially in the US, where the amount of um, concern you can read about how much the US Treasury needs to borrow... I mean, this is, this is all pointing where this goes. Everybody thinks that because interest rates have risen so quickly, they will let it very quickly fall. Not so. They're going to fall slowly, and the effect that they have on the economy is only going to be felt as a lagging effect. So, um, although rates may stump, start to come down, the consequences for earnings, corporate earnings, and for consumption are going to be dramatically poorer, and it takes time to work through. Yeah, now, you mentioned earnings. Uh, it's a big, big week in the US in particular. We hear from the likes of Tesla, some more of the uh, big banks. Any, anything that you're looking out for in particular? Well, I'm always interested to watch Tesla. Beats me where they're going to get earnings from, <laughs> because if you're producing less cars and you're selling them more cheaply and newer car makers in the EV space are out-competing you, I'm amazed that people still look to the quality of Tesla's earnings. But, hey-ho, there's no point in arguing about what markets think of Tesla. Uh, I've been very interested by the US bank results, a real set of mixed, very positive and very poor numbers. But I think what we're going to see is generally a decline in earnings, and that means that stocks are going to behave more like corporate bonds in that they're going to give steadier returns. Now, that's already happened. They've almost become like utilities in some ways, almost just producing... Um, results that justify their stock prices. But that's only part of the market. That's the sort of fundamental value part of the market. The real issue is when do the same rules apply to the overinflated tech markets? And that's where we might see more uh, pain. All right, Bill, got to leave it there. Good to see you. Been a while since you've been on the programme. Good to have you back. Delighted to be back.
That's it from me. I'm back with our morning edition at half past 11 tomorrow. I hope very much to see you then. In the meantime, do stay tuned. Coming up after this short break, it's the news hour with Mark Austin, and he's live in Jerusalem. Don't go away. <laughs>